In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. We confess, most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord, have mercy upon us. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, mercifully hear our prayers, and having set us free from the bonds of our sin, deliver us from every evil. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The first lesson for the Sunday known as Quinquagesima is recorded in the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel, chapter 16. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, How can I go? Saul will hear about it and kill me. The Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, Do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by, but Samuel said, Nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, But Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, Are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered, but he is tending the sheep. Samuel said, Send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent and had him brought in. He was ruddy with a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, Rise and anoint him. He is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. Samuel then went to Ramah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. You with your arm redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. The second lesson is recorded in St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 13. And now I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. 
It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 18. Glory be to you, O Lord. Jesus took the twelve aside and told them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be handed over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. On the third day he will rise again. The disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them, and they did not know what he was talking about. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, What do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw it, they also praised God. This is the gospel of the Lord.
Grace and peace to you from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus. It was a once in a lifetime opportunity that Jesus was passing by his way. But he was on his way to Jerusalem, and knowing what would happen to him in Jerusalem, we know that he would not be passing that way again. He asks this blind man, what do you want me to do for you? Wouldn't you love that? For Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, to ask you, what do you want me to do for you? Oh boy, have I got a list. Truth is, though, that you are not really that much different than this blind beggar, just as needy. For you live in a world of blindness, a fallen world, with a fallen body, with sin, death, and the devil waging war against your body, against your life, against your relationships, sometimes by your own fault, sometimes by the fault of others. You desperately want these things to to go away and for good things to come. Peace, security, money, health, respect. In our gospel, we see a man with desperate need. Desperate to be heard by Jesus. Desperate to be helped by Jesus. Others wanted him to keep quiet. He was causing a bit of a scene, but he would not be stopped. He would not be silenced. So my question is, if we are not that much different, if we are indeed in just as much need as this man, why are we so silent by comparison? Why do we not cry out in, in the same way? And you say, well, well, we do, sort of. We do cry, Lord, have mercy, because the liturgy teaches us to say it. But who of us would come up with that on our own? How many of us would would still sing it or say it, even if the ordo didn't say to sing it or say it? Or much less if everyone was telling us to keep quiet? Is it because we actually have no need for mercy? Or on the other side of it, do do we think that Jesus really isn't concerned about our needs, including our physical ones? Do we take for granted that Jesus will probably be coming this way again and so we can always ask if it really gets bad? Is it because we have managed to avoid the mark of death and decay upon our lives? In other words, that that things are going pretty well. My need is not that great. Thank you very much. I fear that sometimes we may avoid crying out for mercy We may avoid looking desperate enough to be heard by Jesus because we feel like we really need to have it all together. Especially when it comes, when we come to church. In fact, it will sometimes happen that that people will will avoid coming to church altogether because, because they don't have it all together and they don't want to appear as if they don't. Because life hasn't turned out as they planned it. And they don't want others to see. Or maybe we do come and we just, we just sing along, Lord have mercy, but, but once the page of the ordo turns, then we get over our desperate need and move on. Everything's all right. We don't need Jesus that much. But if we do not need him, 
If we do not cry out, Lord, have mercy, and and mean exactly that, that we are lost, entirely lost without his aid, that we cry out as if this is the last chance we'll ever have to get help. If we do not cry out, then we do not get the chance to hear him say, what do you want? Unless we have desperate need of him, he passes by. Unless we repent, he has nothing to give us. If we pretend that we have no need of him because we don't really want to make a scene, especially when Jesus is passing by, especially when he's close enough to hear us and we close enough to hear him, then we will receive none of the things which he wishes to give. But, lest you think it too late, lest you think that it's, that it's too late to cry out for him, that he's, he's passed you by and he may never return again, that you've missed your opportunity to cry out for mercy to Jesus. Note carefully where Jesus was going. In our gospel for today, Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. And what would happen there? In Jerusalem, Jesus would be handed over to the Gentiles, mocked, shamefully treated, spit upon, killed, and on the third day rise from the dead. Jesus goes to Jerusalem, and there he faces the scorn and contempt of those who felt no need for mercy. No need for all. And yet he goes. That is, he goes to Jerusalem For them, for those who mock and spit upon him, no less than those who have loved him. He goes to Jerusalem for those who who kept others from crying out to him, no less than for those who did. Jesus goes to Jerusalem for those who gave in and hid their need from him, even though they needed him at that moment the most. Jesus was passing by, and he went on not to leave you, not to leave you behind, but to save you. Jesus went on from from here, from there, to Jerusalem, to the cross, to the grave. And then he came back, he passed that way again, went into heaven. Jesus' disciples didn't understand it at the time. Not until he had risen, not until he had ascended and finally sent the Holy Spirit at Pentecost as he had promised. Then it became clear to them that through the gift of the Holy Spirit, Jesus passes by again. He passes our way. This time, not by sight, but by faith. By his word, by his promise. Jesus is here because he said so. We have been humbled by his love, a a perfect love that, that never fails. A love that is, and we are humbled by our sinfulness and our lack of love. We are beggars indeed, in desperate need of mercy. How could we ever let Jesus pass by again? But rather we fall down on our knees and cry out every Sunday, Lord, have mercy. And it's here in this place that Jesus brings us towards him. He says to us, stands before us and says, Come here. What do you want? And there he stands before you, ready to give everything. 
Indeed, he has done it. He has given himself to you, his own life. And now, even this morning, he gives the forgiveness of sins in holy absolution. Through bread and wine, he gives the forgiveness of sins in his holy supper. What do you want? And the answer of faith is, Lord Jesus, I want you. And it is this faith that saves you. In it, he comes to you. He comes for for all of you, for all of your needs. Including everything that ails you in body, mind, or spirit. He comes for your knees and, and your back, for your stroke, for your cancer, for your loneliness, your depression, your anxiety. He comes for your guilt, for your fear, for your despair. And says, what do you want me to do? Lord, I want to see. Lord, I want not to be afraid. Lord, I want you. And Jesus gives his life to you. But in fact, it isn't a -a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, is it? but in every Sunday opportunity. And that matters little because we have the greatest need every single time Jesus passes by. Though it is true, perhaps, perhaps this may be the last time. Maybe today is the last opportunity to receive life from Jesus before he releases you from this world of sorrow. And there is no more begging or blindness or dying. Only Jesus so that when we see him again, he stands before us, he calls us to him and asks one more time, what do you want? And then we will not say, I want to see, but I want to live. He declares that he's already given it. That he who lives and believes in me, Jesus says, will live. Do you believe this? Then you have it. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We join in confessing the Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven,
Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, you are the God who works wonders, the greatest of all wonders being the giving of your only begotten Son to suffer and die in our place and win for us forgiveness, life, and salvation. Grant us a steadfast faith in Jesus Christ, a cheerful hope in your mercy, and a sincere love for you and one another. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious Lord, because of your tender love toward us, you have established among us the means by which you deliver your grace. Give faithfulness to all those whom you have called to be servants of your mysteries, that through their preaching of the Holy Gospel and administration of the Holy Sacraments, the faith of those who hear and receive would be sustained and strengthened. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Ever-present Lord, you have promised never to leave us nor forsake us, but to abide with us until the end of time. Be with all those who suffer loneliness. Comfort them with your promise to always be with your children and let them find companionship and love within the household of faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, you establish earthly governments among us to create and sustain good order in our societies. Bless those whom you have placed in authority over us, that they would keep that good order among us for the benefit of all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father of mercies and God of all comfort, our only help in time of need. Look with compassion upon all who are suffering at this time. Assure them of your mercy, deliver them from the temptations of the evil one, and heal them according to your will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, from this holy altar, your Son delivers to us his very body and blood to eat and to drink for the forgiveness of our sins. Bless those who approach the altar this day, Restore unto them the joy of your salvation and give them peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal God, here in your holy house, we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, which includes all those who have fallen asleep in Jesus and now rest in peace from their labors. Shine your face upon us and keep us in your steadfast love, that we might dwell with them in Christ's kingdom, which has no end. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
Jesus Christ, through you all things were created, and through you all things have their purpose. You judged the world through water, but saved believing Noah and the church with the same righteous flood. With water you rescued Israel from slavery, destroying her enemy in the Red Sea, and led her through the Jordan River into the Promised Land. You spoke through the prophets, ruled through the kings, and mediated through the priests on behalf of your people, until it was time for your blessed passion, the sacrifice of the true Lamb of God. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Jesus Christ, you did not turn away from the stroke of justice we deserved, but absorbed its blow only to rise three days later. As you promised your apostles, so comfort us with the knowledge that you have ascended into heaven to prepare eternal bliss for us and rule all things in our favor, that we may carry out your Pentecost command to preach the gospel to all nations. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this Holy Supper. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace.